Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Kraus. Our guest today is Afshan Khan. Afshan is the Portfolio Executive of Hardware for Innovation Works, which is a local economic empowerment organization here in Pennsylvania. Afshan, welcome to the pod. Thank you, Spencer. Awesome. Nice to be here. Good to have you. Uh, so we, we did a panel discussion, I guess, a couple of weeks back, um, where you and I got to see each other for the first time in, in many years. Uh, we worked together a bit ago, uh, and it was good to see you. And so I just figured it'd be fun to do this. I'm glad you accepted. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. I saw all the other great people that you have on the, on the podcast and, and got excited uh, to be a part of it. So this is great. Awesome. Yeah, it's kind of fun. I mean, the idea is to sort of like just hang out with people and get to know them better. And I remember um, one of the people I had on was saying that it was kind of refreshing just to be at one of these, but there wasn't any agenda or, you know, like, she had done one where it was totally staged and canned and everything was, you know, like a script and it's like, this is great. <laughs> so, well, yeah. good. Well, it, 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 this is certainly not scripted. Thanks. <laughs> so um, how did you get to be uh, the portfolio executive hardware at Innovation Works? I remember you had a different title last time I saw you, but still in the same organization. Um, that, that's a great question. Um, when uh, uh, we exited from our building and materials company in southwestern Pennsylvania, I joined um, uh, working on the manufacturing initiatives at Innovation Works. I remember. Um, and that's where we met, right? Um, I got involved uh, pretty quickly, um, and with with um, uh, with more programming uh, with uh, Alpha Lab Gear and early start state startup to help them build their product. Awesome. I myself am not an engineer or a technically uh, 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 skilled person. My background is in manufacturing and building and scaling product. Awesome. Folks like you come in with those great technical skills uh, in all different areas. That's nice of you to say. Well, it's true. And whether it's electronics or enclosures or packaging, all of the parts that come together in the supply chain uh, to help companies. And what's exciting um, is to see those companies do their prototyping, get their help, and really, truly no matter how brilliant they are, not stumble over, over, you know, getting their product prototype iteration go. Yeah. So you're saying it's like, thanks to technical experts that they don't have to worry as much about that. Yes. Yeah. That's awesome. yes. So for context of people listening, I was a consulting engineer for that program and Afshan was the person that brought me in. So yeah. Perfect. Yeah. The yeah. scalable program. Um, and, uh, I don't think there's anything quite like it, uh, in the U S across accelerators. That's awesome. Um, the uh, the program bringing in and doing a deep dive on a, on a, on a product teardown or a technical review with companies is um, is pretty new. Most uh, most folks like hacks or others who try to help you build your product really try to help you find supply chain that's sort of a step away from where you are in terms of your understanding and sort of hands on um, because they they have someone who's who's an intermediary to connect uh, your product and have it made for you. The challenge there is you don't really know what goes into your cost of goods. You don't really know exactly how it's built. And when you have to make iterations to that product, it becomes, you know, a do-over, a complete do-over. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's often the case. I mean, you see all kinds of features getting added and removed for, for assembly. Um, actually, I, I I'm glad you brought up the teardowns. I forgot about that. That was a fun, a fun scheme. So I, if I remember correctly, and please interject here, cause I'm going to get it wrong, but it was, you'd take apart the product that the uh, portfolio company had, and you would try to find optimizations for, for production and also just for it being reliable and functional and scale as product. Exactly right. Yeah. Exactly so right. It was cool. I mean, it was, I, I used to joke, like you got to be like Statler and Waldorf from the Muppets, you know, where you do like, it, it, I mean, it, it's much easier to critique than it is to actually go and do what the companies then did, which was, you know, iterate on the design and, you know, do the, in the trenches work. I mean, it was a great intro. It was a good way to get to meet a lot of people really quickly. Our mutual friend, Mike for Micah, uh, yep. was also a co-consultant at the time and is now running gear, which is awesome to see. I've uh, been really, really happy to see that happen. And, yeah. Uh, I'm actually interested to hear kind of what he's up to in the role, just because I... Uh... I'd be happy to delve into that. One of the things you and I talked about was, you know, lots of changes at IW. Um, uh, we brought in uh, a bunch of new people 
Uh, Mike from ICA is um, taking over for managing director of hardware that includes Apple Lab here. It's awesome. Um, I didn't realize that. Okay, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it's, it, it would be the whole hardware portfolio. Uh, Megan Shaw, who's our managing director of, uh, for life sciences and Alpha Lab Health. Yeah. Um, Alana was telling me about that initiative, but I haven't seen it up close yet. No, Alana. Sorry, Terry. I'm, okay. Apologies. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, and then Raju, who's our new chief investment officer, and then we have a whole bunch of other new folks as well. Um, lots of changes, you know. Rich's announcement of his retirement. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Um, so big changes. I think it's what's exciting about it is that we really have a terrific team. We've always had a really good team, but I think now all the pieces are filled. There's always some kind of gap. Yeah. You know, transition. I know that Mike always wanted to make like some changes to how things were done. So I'm kind of curious to hear if he's been like doing them or. He's going to upgrade um, the shop and the and the equipment and so forth at Alpha Lab here in a big way. We're we're awesome. opening up, getting past COVID, hopefully, and um, we've got folks in our virtual uh, rolling cohort uh, who are in there and, and working away. Um, one of the things that uh, he really wants to focus on is to help companies quickly do those iterations uh, and cut through a lot of the issues they might have uh, in their early versions uh, so that they can can know how to scale. Yeah, I mean, if you get a guy like Mike to give you advice, I mean, you're, you're going to be able to cut out a lot of errors in the beginning, I think. Exactly right. Yeah. Exactly right. So it's exciting. What I find exciting and, and actually a little bit challenging is to say um, hardware companies and hardware products still have to do fundraising. Yeah. And fundraising is sort of a necessary evil in a lot of ways. I don't, yeah, for I, sure. I haven't met many people who enjoy it. Reason. Right. Yeah. Um, it, it seems like people enjoy having raised funds. Like I was, I was having cocktails with a friend last night who has a company, I'll say, because I don't want to out him or anything, but he was talking about a similar thing I was talking about with SK, but just like when you get like bigger and bigger deals, it's super exciting and you don't believe it happened. And, but he was saying for him, like raising, you know, a, a seed round, it was like a couple million dollars or something. It was like just a huge rush and really exciting and thrilling after the fact, like once, once they hit those goals. And, yeah. You know. Yeah. It is. It just, um, it takes a lot to get there. Yeah. For um, sure. uh, there's, um, uh, still so much money awash on the coasts. Uh, that that it's it's increasing here. More and more uh, investors are interested here, but it's still you know something we have to do more for. for. Um, I think naturally the companies we have, the folks are brilliant technologists and builders. Yeah, they're not the greatest marketers. <laughs> <laughs> I always complain about Very that. Cool. We don't really toot our own horn very well. That's like the same thing that like Joel Reed at the Pittsburgh Robotics Network's been saying for the last four years i feel like, like Very pretty much good. to a t yes did you and him rehearse this <laughs> no but i am on the board for uh, pittsburgh robotics network so, so yeah yeah. That's yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yeah very true very yeah. true um you know what's exciting here in this area is that you know compared to even other rust-built cities we've really made a total transition folks probably don't realize that there's still sort of an old world sitting out there that are doing things somewhat conventionally yeah. from a from a building and marketing standpoint um but there's so much new blood here there's yeah. so much uh activity here um and so much you know promise it's it's exciting it's really yeah. exciting no i mean I, I was just in the process of um helping relocate form logic to lawrenceville from robinson uh for those listening like robinson's kind of a suburb if you're not from pittsburgh and, and lawrenceville sort of like the hipster uh area with a lot of robotics companies there but it was neat because I just found these hiking trails behind our new building that you can you can walk to NREC on the hiking trail. Like it's really cool. Oh, nice. Like Carnegie Robotics is right there, and you know, I mean, I I knew we were technically on Robotics Row or whatever, but I you know, it, it really hit home when I I just was walking by the tracks and you see like that giant SIA you know riverbed robot you know just hanging out <laughs> and. Then, <laughs> Uh, like, you know, just all these awesome, you know, robotics powerhouses right there. And so it's, it's cool to be a part of that. Um, yeah. and then, I mean, all the hipsterism is great. Like the, uh, it's really good culinary scene down there that I like a lot. And oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, becoming a regular to mommy. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. There's a lot of, a lot of good things happening. So you were instrumental in moving them from Robinson. I helped. I mean, yeah. you know, we all, we all worked on it. Um, 
but that's great. I, I was one of the people that went down there kind of early on because I was, I was the new guy. Right. So, I mean, you know, I just didn't really have as much of an office presence. And so, um, it was easy for the, for, you know, um, my boss, our CEO to send me down there to just sort of oversee some early machine installations and make sure things were going well with like facilities and, you know, help massage some of those relationships and, and get all that stuff going. So cool. yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's not what I was expecting to walk into, but kind of fun, you know, <laughs> it was yeah. interesting challenges. And I remember, you know, we're moving like millions of dollars of machine tool inventory onto the floor and, um, just thinking like, um, I don't know. I, I, I think I had a story there, but it was exciting. I mean, it was, it was fun to see. And, you know, you felt good, you know, when you would kind of, there were all kinds of obstacles, right? Like there's stuff that like, I remember at one point, okay, so we, we had this machine, but um, there was an oversight and we didn't have all the fluids you need to run it. So you need like oil to oil the ways on the machine. You need mm -hmm. uh, antifreeze like you'd need for your car. Um, and actually it's kind of funny how we got that. I'll tell you in a second. And we needed, um, you know, uh, coolant, like the stuff you run through that sprays on the part. And uh, actually more than coolant, though, I don't want to bore you too much, but the, the purpose is to remove like chunks of metal that are coming off the part and kind yeah. of wash them away. Yeah. But um, so anyway, so we're missing all that crap because somebody didn't order it. And so um, I was in a situation where the machine tool installer from the company that made it was going to walk. It was a company called Grobe. These are like you know, seven hundred dollar, seven hundred thousand dollar assets or eight hundred thousand dollar assets. So yeah. they're, they're pretty valuable. And um, you know, to have that sitting there for an extra two weeks because the installer walks is is not a great thing. So uh, not making parts, you know, <laughs> so it's it's yeah. pretty brutal. So I mean, we we all of us. I mean, the CEO himself drove to pick up the the way oil. We found a vendor. We were all calling people. Me and one of the technicians started driving around to auto parts stores to buy, because these are German machines. We were buying um, antifreeze for BMWs. <laughs> it's the same stuff. So we, we got, uh, I want to say, 40 uh, little jugs of it, like for your car, to fill up four of these machines, because each one took 10. And wow. then, um, you know, to get the coolant, another guy went and got that. And we, we had everything within a day, and they still walked. <laughs> so the scheduler thought we wouldn't be able to do it. But, you know, oh dear! I remember posing <laughs> all in front of the machine. We sent a picture, like, "Hey, ready to go." <laughs> well, that but we got it done. All those machines are making parts now, so it's been really cool. So I have to ask you, Spencer, how many? You know, Form Logic is a company that spans the country. Um, how many women work at Form Logic? Not as many as I would like is is the short answer. Why do you think that is? That's a good question. I mean, I told you earlier, like I volunteered for the Girls of Steel. I mean, I had my friends on here with a company that, do you know Xeno Workwear? No. So they're, um, so my friend Anna, who's the CEO, um, or Nyastia is like her actual name, but it's less Anglicized. So she goes by Anna. Um, and she was a project manager at Caterpillar. And when you go in a shop floor, as you know, uh, being in production, you have to wear a lot of times a steel toed, you know, yep. protective work boots. And they don't actually, or up until recently, they didn't have like, you know, the tooling for women. It was all based on men's feet and they're ugly as shit. And so if you're a female executive, now you've got to wear fucking snow boots, you know, into the yeah, boardroom. Yeah, basically, yeah. And Heavy. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. So you've worn yeah. them, you know. Yeah, well, I know. <laughs> Your feet get all sweaty and gross. Yep. Like, I, I had to wear them to a site visit recently, and I mean, I don't even like them. So what Zena does that's really cool um, is, you know, Anna and her husband, uh, Demetria, who's the uh, head of operations, um, kind of together, you know, went out to all these different production facilities. They built partnerships, and they made, like, an attractive, comfortable women's work boot that you'd actually want to be seen in and wear. And, you know, yeah, it's, it's a really neat product. I tell everyone about it because I, I want them to do really great. <laughs> that is great. That yeah. is great. And but so, why don't you think there's enough women there? I just, I don't know. I think it's, if I had to guess, and obviously I'm not an expert on this, but if I had to guess, I mean, I think it's just maybe outdated thinking. Like the fact that like there historically haven't been, and it, it just takes a while for the ship to turn. And so, I mean, like my grandmother, when, you know, she was trying to get her PhD in history in the sixties, had the Dean of history at Pitt say, ma'am, you should make babies. Oh. Uh, you have no, no business getting an advanced degree. You know, and, and she went and did it anyway and went to write several books and teach at Pitt and CMU. And, you know, she also made babies or else I wouldn't be here. <laughs> but, 
Um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, that, it just kind of infuriates me to hear about shit like that. But I mean, I don't know. Like, you would know better than me, you know, but no, my I think you're exactly right. Yeah. There's outdated thinking. But to me now, what's amazing, you know, to see just in the last four or five years how much our robotics and our AI and our, you know, deep tech companies in this region have, have just grown. And to see so few women either in C-level positions or in technical positions. Yeah. You know, if you if you have a woman, she's going to be the head of HR or she's going to be, <laughs> I'm sorry to say it. I'm, no, I'm giggling because our head of HR is a woman. <laughs> I didn't mean yeah, it's all right. for our team, but, or, you know, yeah. the head of communications or marketing and yeah. not necessarily sort of, you know, get your hands dirty, get yeah. your work boots on. Although I don't know if you've looked at like RE Squared's directors recently. Like they've got some I pretty awesome women in, in positions of really? upper management at least. I haven't looked at their executive leadership recently, so I can't really speak to that. Um, but like, but I met Amanda. Segura yeah, Amanda's Amanda's great. The, I mean, yeah, and she's, she's great. I mean, she's one of a few uh, over right. there. Yeah. So um, I, I like her a lot. She's been on the show. She's coming back on. Um, <laughs> And so I, um, and, and she's not just some random person they put in there just to have a higher female body count. I mean, she's actually quite intelligent and good at her job. I would assume I've never worked with her in that capacity, but I mean, well, I just think, I just think there's, she talks so the talk. Much, yes, she does. <laughs> I think there's just so much more opportunity for women now, even apart from saying, Hey, we want to, you know, reach a certain gender parity. There's so much more opportunity for women. I'm not sure what's stopping folks. Well, I'm seeing some of the the women that I mentored on the Girls of Steel, like out in engineering jobs now, and that's been really rewarding, right? That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And Girls so, of Steel, I love it. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. I, Patty, we were just talking about it. like she's great. Yes. Love her too. <laughs> Patty wrote, "Come on the show." <laughs> so, but um, yeah, no, I mean, I, and I, I just you know interviewed a friend of mine who's a woman who's a bioscientist um, who I really love and I've known. I say that because I've known her for like most of my life, and I do love her. She's one of my best friends. Um, yeah, I, um, I don't know. I, I wish we had more women in this field. <laughs> yeah. I think we're working toward it. I, I think we're, what I would like to see is, you know, a point where it didn't matter. Like I, I would like to see, you know, like, a, a, and I know that's not the present because, you know, it's, it's stacked so far the other way, unfortunately, but I mean, I'm such an idealist. Like, I just want to, I, I don't want it to matter what someone's gender is. Like, I just want to. I don't think it does to like the modern hiring manager, maybe subconsciously in a way that I'm not aware of, mm -hmm. but I hope not, but maybe I, I, I'm not ruling it out. But I mean, I don't know. I think if we had the supply, like I just would love to think, you know, you could hire a person just on merit, regardless of their gender or their race or any of that bullshit and just be like, this is a talented person that I get along with, you know, that I want to work with. So anybody listening to the show, if they know women who are either contemplating a, a degree in, in, uh, in, in this field or uh, already in this field and want to rise, tell them to tell them to look everywhere because the opportunities yeah, are there. Call me if you want some advice. Or, That's right. Like that. yeah, That's happy, right. Happy to help. Yeah. But um, yeah, yeah. Well, and also like, I mean, I think you're super hireable, right? If you're like a woman with real engineering skills right now. I believe so. Yeah. I believe so. Yeah. Right. And, you know, thinking about those are, those are the engineers and, and the C-level folks. I mentioned to you that I'm, uh, I've been on the board of New Century Careers oh, cool. since 2014. And someone would ask, well, why, you know, what does machining have to do? Well, you know, when I ran a building materials company, most of our folks were, were lower skilled and semi-skilled folks. And the fact that they were able to, um, very, very, um, uh, uh proficiently, run all of these different types of machines showed me what it takes to run a factory floor, right? That's that what I, that's what we had to do, a very large factory floor. What um, kind of square footage and volume were you 100,000 square feet. Nice. Yeah. It was it's twice it was as a, big as us. Yeah. It was, it was about a, a little over cool. 20 acres. Um, nice. And, uh, uh, and we, we produce thousands of parts a day. Badass. Um, so, um, so when I think about New Century Careers, what I love about it is that it's it's really a free program to help anybody, like you said, of any race, gender, background, even skill set who has an interest in a good career, a career that would support a machining uh, job for Formlogic, right? Yeah, we need those. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's yeah. right. 
Um, so there's just, there's a lot of opportunities out there and it's, what's exciting to me is to see, um, to see stories every, every, every month of folks who have gone through their career or their training at new century careers. And I've really sort of turned their lives around and that's, that's, cool. that's exciting to me, you know, I, I'm not a socialist, but wealth should be shared. There's no yeah. reason to, uh, to have it trickle down. Yeah, well, I like the idea of, you know, like being able to, you know, have that mobility, like you said, you know, if you, if a person's presented with opportunities, you know, and, and ability to, you know, better themselves and, you yeah. know, work on stuff and then they can go out and do things and earn more and more money. I mean, that's, that's great. <laughs> yes. So. Yeah. And it, it, you know, it, it helps not just that person, but their whole household and their relationships and everything. So. Yeah. So I'll, I'll get off my soapbox. No, no, it's all good. Women should apply everywhere for all the jobs. Yeah. So. And I mean, um, I, I will go on to say something I said recently to um, somebody at, at a work event, which is, you know, he was asking me, um, this was somebody that had a program to, um, you know, advance people in their careers. And he's like, do you, what are you kind of skills are you looking for? Do you care if, you know, they're credentialed and this, that, the other? I'm like. I don't give a fuck what credentials somebody has as long as they're intelligent, resourceful, and motivated and reliable. You know? <laughs> like, yes. I yes. Mean, you know, you got to be adaptive. You got to know what you're doing. I mean, ideally, like if, if you're hiring for like a specialist position, somebody should have skills in that field. <laughs> but right. I mean, it, like a smart person that's going to do what they said they were going to do is, you know, I mean, that's, that's all I really care about. Like, I don't care if you got a PhD. I mean, I care if you're you know, person of your word. You know? Right. That's exactly right. You really get things 100%. done and, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I agree 100%. Yeah. Um, and that's what's exciting to be part of this environment, part of Innovation Works, part of um, the robotics scene, part of hardware. Um, it's, it's really fun. I have to say, I do miss Alana. I'll have to say it. Uh, yeah. She was a big part of... Uh, of um, starting Alpha Lab Gear uh, um, and, and was really um, instrumental in getting us uh, going. Uh, I'm excited to see where Mike is going to take this now. Yeah, so Lana was doing basically Mike's job, but in a sort of different capacity before. Almost in the startup fa yeah. you know, phase one capacity uh, yeah. for, for so many years. Alana Diamond, for those listening. <laughs> yes, Alana Diamond, now running uh, the 412, 412 Venture, Venture Fund. Fund. Yeah, yes. which I was excited to see that because yes. I feel like that gives her more like the fact that it's private, I think gives her more ability to sort of really flex and allocate resources in creative ways. And perfectly said, yeah, yeah. I, that's my perspective as well. Yeah, I haven't seen what she's been doing with it, but that was kind of my anticipation. I was really excited to see the direction she took it, like with her mind. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, she um, she's a great uh, she's a great advisor, mentor, as well as uh, you know, generally a person who connects other people. She was always good to me. I mean, she, yeah. you know. Yeah. It's also instrumental in bringing me in there. And um, early on, I mean, I, I spent a lot of time in her office just talking to her. And yeah. you know, she gave me career advice early in my career. I, I like her a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and 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 it's it's sad in a way to see her go, but it's still terrific to have her expand the the ecosystem here with 412 Venture Fund. Yeah. So that, that to me. Have you been tracking any of their interaction in like a public little available way? Or? Um. I know they're they're very busy and and they have made several investments and I believe they're about to close their fund. Oh, cool! Soon. That's awesome. Uh, I just don't have any details. No worry, I just curious. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. How I get my news? I'm, I'm like a rock. <laughs> <laughs> just ask people. So, but yeah, no, that's no, it's ex exciting. Um, I guess I guess I have to ask the question. You know, if for folks who are um, contemplating, sort of. Um, you know, the, the thinking about building a startup, what would keep what, whether, you know, folks or folks in the audience, what keeps them up at night? Is it, is it fundraising? Is it building a team? Is it, I mean, I can say from having done it, what kept me up at night, um, like, I don't know, being able to pay the bills was a pretty big stressor. Yep. Um, yep. trying to, you know, and that from a few different directions, I guess financing was one part of that. Um, sales was another big part. Um, and I mean, I, it's, it's a few different companies I've, you know, I've had these struggles with, um, I mean, I've been a serial entrepreneur, you know, most of my life. And so 
Um, I, I think, I mean, when I was in sixth grade, I made locker alarms with another sixth grader in an <laughs> attic and we sold them to the other six. We sold two units. <laughs> it wasn't a blockbuster, but, um, and one of them got destroyed with an ax cause it wouldn't stop going off. <laughs> but, um, I don't know. I've, I've been trying to do that and I constantly just addicted to it, I think a little bit. And so, cool. Yeah. Cool. What do you think keeps people up? And I mean, you've been around it more than I have probably. Yeah, I think I think folks get worried about how much cash runway they have, you know, but to me, there's always, you know, it's you always uh, you always have to pay something for something, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So if you're going out there fundraising, you're giving up some of your company and some of your potential. Um, so it's it's a it's a mixed bag on 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 how you can grow traction with customers. Uh, and have enough cash to sort of build. That's that's I think that's the the real uh, the real challenge of it all. So uh, when I look at folks like Ari Squared, yeah, and I am Robotics. I mean, they're fucking bootstrapped. Like Ari yeah. Squared is totally. Well, he bootstrapped for a long time before. Yeah. Uh, or have the they days. taken on financing now? Pardon? Have they taken on uh, capital now? Innovation Works invested in them years ago. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Shame on me. I apologize. <laughs> I don't know what other funding they've taken on, but yeah. I, I, Innovation Works invested in them years and years ago. That's awesome. I, I yeah. had no idea. Well, I know they've taken must a whole have new commercialization. So, so, I mean, you stole the, the stock in that. Oh, yeah. Nice. Yeah, I believe so. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. awesome. Yeah, they haven't had an exit, so yeah, we would. Sweet. Um, I, I knew one company that was, uh, they got, um, this is where I'm going to show my lack of knowledge, but I think it was a convertible note, I want to say. But correct me if I'm wrong here, but uh, it was basically like they could pay it off early. And so they, they paid it down be, like rather than keeping innovation works invested and they just, you know, borrowed the money and paid it back as quickly as they could. And that, that's an option too. Yeah. That's an option too. Yeah. Um, most of our investments are now in the form of convertible notes. Um, and, and those uh, are somewhat founder friendly because they don't have uh, a cap. So you're not limited by that valuation at that time. Uh, and they, um, they, they have, uh, terms that can work alongside any other investors. That's um, cool. So it's, it's, uh, folks get sometimes hung up on it. They think that, um, because we're a nonprofit early stage investor, we, you know, our terms apply to everyone in the round and that's not necessarily the case. Um, it, we're sort of a special, unique investment in that. That's regard. cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, I mean, I know like if, if I was doing like a, a venture back startup, I would definitely want that option of, you know, like you telling me I can get money for this, but I don't have to give up, you know, equity forever in my company or. Yeah. Uh, and, and seats on the board Spencer, or, um, yeah. in the, over the last couple of years, uh, uh, there's no security either. So there's no securitization of your assets against the note. What does that mean exactly? Just cause I'm kind of a lay person here. Um, so, so you, you were, were saying, saying about, you know, worrying about paying the bills. Yeah. Uh, if for some reason the company went belly up, that can really Oh, no. as opposed to where if you got it from a bank, you would have your house up or something. Right. It's yeah. an unsecured credit. Yeah, credit. that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, it is awesome for the founders because then they don't have to worry about, you know, selling off their IP. Yeah, you something. wouldn't be able to get away with that as a for-profit business. Right. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it becomes tricky that way. So, so there's a lot of uh, founder advantages to it. That's so, really cool. Yeah. And you know, you were asking me when I started in, in innovation works, I started in manufacturing and I spent many years there. And in the very beginning, I was thinking, oh, well, where else could I go in this company and, and, and try things? But then I, I got really excited by what we were doing at Apple up here and with all the hardware companies. And I really didn't think about the investment side of it. And it was a few years ago when this um, opportunity opened up, and it was Alana who called me and said, "Hey, Afshan, have you thought about applying for this?" I was like, "No, I hadn't thought about that." And and so it was an internal process and an external process, all the same, uh, in terms of uh, looking for uh, candidates. But moving over to the investment side of the house, it's it's really exciting. I'm I'm very competitive, Spencer. So I the companies that yeah, I mean I just. <laughs> I want them to win. I want them to grow. I want them to scale. I want them to fundraise. I want them to get customers. Um, That's awesome. I, I do have some of my favorites in my portfolio, but um, uh, uh, I think we all do. Yes, yes. But to me, I feel like 
I have a tangential part of their team and, and, you know, and I'm just rooting for them as, as to support them in whatever we can do. So, um, so that's, what's sort of fun and exciting about, about working in the investment portion at IW, not necessarily just, um, doing the VC, you know, evaluation process, but actually sort of helping the company in whatever capacity, um, you know, to keep growing. So that's exciting. Awesome. Yeah. 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 That's, I mean, do you ever feel like a sense of, um, like, I don't know, I'm not a parent, so it's hard for me to conceptualize this, but I feel like if you bring a company into the world and you help them out, like you must feel some sense of, you know, pride, responsibility, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, to me, the value proposition that a company has is really important. And there's something that I can't get my mind around. Um, perhaps they're more on the gaming side or, or something like that. I'm still trying to get my mind around cryptocurrency and things yeah, like that. Both. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but in terms of thinking about the value proposition, and particularly because I ran a manufacturing company, thinking about the B2B enterprise value proposition. Oh, those ones are fun. Those are the ones that are most exciting for me. Yeah. 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 When I, I think early on, like when I was a lot younger, you couldn't conceptualize a B2B because you weren't exposed to it. Right. And so, you know, as a kid, I mean, you just think of B2C and, you know, that's what you get excited about. And even as a student and early on, but then yeah. you start, you know, working in businesses and seeing that and you're like, oh shit, this is way larger scale. <laughs> you know? so, way larger scale, you can make more of an impact. There's, you know, it's, um, it's more of a benefit. Uh, and I think, you know, there's a stickiness there that with that customer, uh, let's say a corporate customer, someone who adopts a, a solution or a process change. And it's pretty exciting, uh, you know, to see, whether it's your software product or your hardware solution implemented uh, in, a, in a production line or in, you know, in a development process of some sort. It's pretty exciting. I completely agree. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't know, like in my career, I, I've built bits that have gone into medical robots. I've built bits that have gone into prostheses. I've built bits that have gone into assistive devices. I've built bits that have gone into spacecraft. Isn't so, that exciting? Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You feel really good. Yeah. It's always been for a different company making the actual thing, but you still feel nice contributing. Yes. You feel like you've contributed and that's, and that's, um, key. Yeah. So that, that's, that's sort of an exciting part. Um, it, it's, it's like that's taking, always been, but mostly it's been. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, it's, it's like taking the product development portion and the customer discovery and the product market fit that the folks coming out of Alpha Lab gear, um, grow grow toward and then seeing sort of the culmination of that you know seeing how the company grows how they hire how they scale um it's quite exciting so, that's awesome yeah sometimes it takes longer for companies you know oh, uh, sure. roger byford you know uh one know of the roger founders byford. of vocalect uh, i feel bad now pardon what, what does vocalect do oh uh, they um they were in barcoding and uh scanning and they were sold to Honeywell. Oh, cool. I have uh, a Honeywell barcode scan at home. It was probably one of theirs. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Um, so Honeywell's whole barcode scanner line used to be Vocalect. At least one major portion of it. Okay. And Roger lives in Texas now. Cool. Um, but uh, Roger said something that was very interesting. He said, you know, uh, he said uh, people looked at, at what I did and what we did as an overnight sensation, but it took 10 years to build that overnight sensation. <laughs> <laughs> 10 plus years. Yeah. Uh, and so it just shows that it takes a long time. And sometimes it, you know, um, it, it, I think it's tough for companies to figure out or founders to figure out, you know, am I still on the right path if I'm, if I'm struggling a bit or sort of plateauing or is it time to hang it up? And that's a difficult thing. You know, what's interesting about Pittsburgh and that's, this is probably just our nature as, as the region, we're afraid to fail. <laughs> you mean just like as a city collectively or individually yeah. as different companies and people or both? Both. Okay. Both. I think we're afraid to fail. Whereas, um, I was talking I'm definitely to... risk adverse. I mean, that, that's right. Yeah. I was talking to someone who moved to here, uh, just this week from the coast. Um, which grew, one, um, from the Bay area. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, he grew up here, but had, you know, moved most of his career over there and wanted to come back because he saw great things happening here. Um, but he said, you know, 
uh, folks out there, whether they're technical or um, sort of you know key business uh, skills, um, can easily find a job anywhere from one startup to the other, or from a startup to you know a Google. Well, I think it's getting that way here, like more and more. I mean, we've got Argo, we've got Aurora, we had Uber for a while until they got, yeah. you know. And Google and Facebook. Yep. yep. Um, and, and Microsoft, it's a, it's I believe. a really cool bit of Facebook, too, with the VR technology. So that's yeah. been really interesting, like the Oculus acquisition. And then, I mean, I, I, from just all hearsay, I mean, it seems like they're, like, scanning people over there. And so there's... Oh, really? <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know if this is public. Maybe we should edit that out. But I haven't signed an NDA with them. <laughs> <laughs> Um, for part of my career, when I worked at Xerox Corporation, when it was a bigger company uh, in Connecticut, we did mergers and acquisitions. Um, so it, uh, I did both divestitures and um, uh, acquisitions uh, at the time. And it's interesting to see like Oculus, like yeah. you mentioned, you know, you know, how the company is positioning an acquisition like that. Yeah, for uh, sure. So, uh, in fact, one of our companies recently, uh, you're probably aware, VIT Initiative, Andy Chan. Oh, cool. Um, I know the name Andy Chan. I don't remember VIT Initiative for some reason. Uh, that's his company. That's awesome. Uh, it was acquired by Sword Health back in the fall. Awesome. Congratulations. Andy yeah. It's, uh, um, it's a good example of how, uh, uh, you know, a startup can have sort of the, the crux of the value proposition in a specific market segment. And theirs was musculoskeletal. Uh, uh, tracking. In oh, interesting. Movements. That's uh, a challenging problem. I've actually worked on that a bit. And very it's, challenging. It's much harder than you would think. Yeah. Like there's so many gotchas that uh, that yeah. make you want to scream and not get sleep when you're working on a project like that. It's yeah, it is challenging, and in so many different environments as well. Well, Sword Health um, was very interested in them because they saw that as a very important key growth market segment, musculoskeletal. Um, Do you know how their tech worked at all? I mean, I'm, um, I'm they nerd. had um, they had sort of a little thing called the arc that a person wore. Um, you you know, only as, needed one arc. You didn't have multiple. Um, I believe you only needed one. That's interesting. Uh, and and you had sort of a base uh, platform that was tracking all your movements. They had even uh, converted some of their technology for COVID tracking uh, uh, when the pandemic hit. I remember um, we had a whole COVID business idea vetting process at SKA at the time. And I mean, we probably burned through like 20 different ideas that, you know, and it was, it was only a good COVID idea if you could um, monetize it within two weeks. You know, <laughs> there's, there's like a few criteria. How did you come up with two weeks? Um, I think it was because nobody knew what was going to happen. It, it was arbitrary, but it was based on yeah. the volatility of the whole political and, you know, I mean, biological landscape and all the crap that was going on. I mean, nobody knew what was really going to happen next. And so is this going to last? Are people going to decide they don't care? Are we going to come up with a cure? You know, are we going to figure out a way to overcome this? I mean, that's, that's kind of what I was hoping for, for what I thought, you know, we'd all come together and, you know, we'd solve it much quicker than we did, but you know, I mean, I don't think we had, there. are we going to quarantine for 30 days and it just won't exist anymore? I mean, there's like, you know, all these questions in your mind, you know, are we going to just drop the state of emergency because, you know, people decide it's worth the risk, like who, who the hell knows? And so, you know, that was two weeks was the amount of risk I was willing to take <laughs> <laughs> where that came from. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's cool. That's yeah. a, it's, it's just like looking back. I mean, it's yeah. uncertain. Yeah, very, a lot of uncertainty. But in truth, life is all uncertain. Isn't it? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. But sometimes more than other, I mean, when the VIX jumps up, <laughs> to the ceiling and I don't know. It was it was a really really interesting. I think because I I, I don't know if I've ever gone and said this, but I I mean I get anxious and I think people that get anxious do better in like really crappy situation. Like when when it's like actually a dire situation, I was like yeah I'm ready. You know I, <laughs> I was like I, I maybe not, I was like I was just calm like I, you know level head. Um, I actually got a bunch of my coworkers to volunteer. We made 700 face shields and gave them out to like underfunded healthcare organizations and oh, cops great. and, you know, first responders and police and firefighters and paramedics, uh, you know, all that stuff. Um, yeah. And, and the way that we did it was really fun. So, I mean, all of us lost all of our work. Uh, so the pipeline dried up, um, but then it ended up being really profitable a year later for another reason I won't get into. But at the time, it was like maybe March or April, and you know we, you know we're 
like on the precipice of like maybe like four big projects that just cl didn't close because because of it well our like, champions in these large companies ended up getting promoted out of roles where, that they were in because they were needed in other places and so mm -hmm. and nobody was certain so nobody wanted to spend r d money i mean you know you, that's not what you spend on when you know the market's that hectic i mean maybe maintenance but you know it's like I don't know. I mean, you're buying face shields, you're buying you know, COVID tests. I mean, yeah. you know, there's, I, I don't know. I'm sure there's other markets that did really well, but um, you're buying Zoom licenses. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I don't know. I, um, you know, it, it didn't seem to be, automation did well, you know, which it goes into that why later was, was good in that year. But um, yeah, uh, you know, we had nothing to do momentarily. And so it was just like, you guys want to just make face shields and see how many we can make. And I'm very competitive too. So I'm just like, let's try to make more than, you know, like a certain maker space. Let's just see if like us as a group of individuals can, can you know, outproduce them and out manufacture. And we did. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. That's fantastic. That's great. So was, yeah. But um... win for the private sector. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, your point about, if a person's anxious, well, that means you're more alert and sort of more, um, more in tune with whatever action has to take place, right? Yeah, you've been preparing for this your whole life. <laughs> well, maybe not, not maybe not COVID, but um, yeah. well, just just the dire situation in general, like whatever it is. But in a way, some of those just because, like, as you're an entrepreneur, Spencer, yeah. some of those key um, strengths have to be there for any entrepreneur because anything could happen. Yeah, right? for sure. It's, it's a volatile job. Right. Right. Anything could happen. Yeah. Um, you could have, uh, you know, a patent for infringement accusation. You could yep. have your major customers shut down. You Absolutely. Know. Um, uh, and, and that's what's, you know, it's sort of a roller coaster ride where you have to, you have to, you know, be prepared in some ways, but you have to be prepared to act. I think that's part of the hardest part. The people who are very indecisive have trouble being entrepreneurs because they, they just can't make the decisions agile in an agile way, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I mean, you see that a lot, especially at bigger organizations, is that analysis paralysis, right? Where yeah. I just needed more information, but you're like, there's never gonna be enough information to satisfy that person, you know, this hypothetical right. situation we're making up right now. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely true. Yeah. Absolutely true. Uh, yeah. When we were running the building materials company, uh, we had just finished uh, an acqu uh, acquisition. Oh, cool. Um, and I remember being, uh, I can't remember what city, maybe it was Chicago, um, and watching the news about the, um, the, the, the housing meltdown and the recession. Ah, uh, brutal. Our timing couldn't be worse. It was just literally a couple months before everything Sucks. just melted down in 2008. Um, but, you know, we, we suffered tremendously about it. Uh, we were primarily new home building uh, uh, focused and the market dropped ah! 60, 70% that's, in one year. It's horrible. Yeah, it, it was, it was, it was very challenging, but, but we had to make decisions, you know, yeah. keep, keep your employees, not keep your employees, shut down, keep going. How'd you, how'd you cope with it? Like, what'd you, what'd you end up doing? Um, we did okay. We, we, we survived. We actually, at the end of that year, um, had another really successful acquisition nice. that helps it, helps us expand our uh, product line and our, uh, applications. Where did you pivot to, to, to survive that? That's where we pivoted to. So, well, so we didn't our... say what though, you said another acquisition and that... Um, an acquisition down in, um, North Carolina. But I mean, like, was it like commercial? Like what? It, it was, it was more, yeah, it was, it was, it was building and commercial, but it okay. was, um, DIY, DIY versus going through home builders and, oh, interesting. and, it, and so the idea is people are trying to save money. So the DIY market's going to do better and yes. or get involved in that. Yeah. And it, we just, it was a perfectly timed acquisition in the sense that the parent company was just moving out of that market segment, they were in a completely oh, different that's cool. business. Yeah. That's awesome. So it worked out. Um, but it's, ch it's challenging to make those decisions, you know, uh, sometimes if you think about it, they can be overwhelming. Think, oh, you know, you've got X number of families depending on this income and, 
Uh, Terrifying. And that, yeah, but uh, but you get through it because um, uh, you're doing what you think is best for everyone. Yeah, and, well, and you're up against the wall, so you have to. I mean, you yeah, have choice. yeah, you so. are, you are. It's it's great. Um, um, but um, but there's there's all kinds of challenges. There's all kinds of challenges in entre- as an entrepreneur that uh, uh, that it helps to be quick, not quick decisions, but you can make thorough decisions with with counsel, obviously wise counsel of the folks that are you know on your team. But at the end of the day, you have to make a decision and keep moving. Yeah, that's for important. sure. Yeah. Fall forward, as Zig Ziglar said. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you actually saw Zig Ziglar in person? I saw Zig Ziglar. See, That's awesome. I'm dating myself now. I'm really old. No, I'm a, I've read a bunch of his books. <laughs> really? <laughs> awesome, yeah. I was just thinking about him this morning. That is so weird. That's really cool. Yeah. I went and saw him in Long Island. At That's a so cool. Yeah. 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 So, uh, but yeah, that yeah, it's it's fun. Um, it's exciting. Did you get to like ask him any questions or? No, it was a yeah. huge, I mean, there were so many people there. So I got to ask Elon Musk a question twice, but it was at a Q and A. It was never like a one-on-one situation. Was it in person? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's, wow. It was an intern at SpaceX. So. Ah, yeah. that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. That's exciting. Yeah. That's exciting. Um, so, so you, you said what keeps you up at night. Um, what makes you excited to, to see progress in terms of what you've done? I mean, I don't know. I really like, I mean, this is going to sound bad given that I work for a company that does manufacturing for the space industry, but I mean, I get the most excited about biomedical projects that I've worked on and just directly contributing to, to kind of human quality of life and longevity of life. Um, I think it's just my dad and my granddad were doctors and I didn't want to go that route. And so, you know, it's like my, my kind of backdoor way to getting that same satisfaction. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if you build a, a biomedical device and it, it, you know, gets to market and, you know, the qualifying surgeon tells you it's awesome to work with, you know, then, you know, you're just like, sweet, you know, like, <laughs> it makes me feel really good, you know, going to, going to help people out. Um, and then I guess the space stuff is kind of exciting too, but for different reasons. But I mean, for me, at least I get more excited about the biomed than I do about the space. Uh, does the biomed excite you because, you know, it helps improve quality of life or it's just, I don't know. It's really fun to, to like augment a person and like, it sounds bad. <laughs> like it's, it just, I don't know. You just feel like a badass. Like if you're able to. So I'm dating myself when I say this yeah. Spencer, but you know, television shows when I was a kid, the $6 million man and the bionic woman. Nice. Have you ever heard of those shows? Lee Majors. What? Lee, Lee Majors. Majors. That's the $6 exactly million right. Man. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I know God. that because of a Norm Macdonald joke, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> He's advertising the bionic ear, which is a hearing aid. He's like, I don't hear so good. <laughs> it's like Lee Matrix, but as an old man. <laughs> He's like, it wasn't a bionic ear like in the show. It was a hearing aid. <laughs> oh, but uh, but yeah, that's augmenting a person, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. No, I, I can play, and I have actually watched some episodes of The Six Million Dollar Man. I mean, I love stuff like that. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's challenging, interesting puzzles to solve. Um, and then at the end of the day, I, I think I'm a bit of a puzzle, puzzle solver. And so, um, I don't know, like some of the stuff you have to do to make that stuff work and it's, you can't really have it not work or, you know, people could die. So you want to, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's high stakes. <laughs> yes, it is high stakes. But I guess also spaces too. So. But biomedical kind of is high stakes for more people, right? Yeah, well, it depends on how you look at it. I mean, the way it's going now, I, I think we're rapidly entering like a new space age. I mean, like if you look at like some of the things that have been announced recently with the private space companies, like the contracts Blue Origin and SpaceX are competing for for like moon missions on a more regular basis. And when I mean, you look at like Starlink and all the stuff that they've put into, you know, I mean, the fact that satellite internet's becoming like more and more accessible. I mean, it's all pretty exciting stuff. I mean, and it's it's like right there. I mean, the right. fact that we can land a rocket now, like we couldn't do that before, you know? And so, I mean, think about how much like that makes space travel more financially viable. I mean, I don't know. It's exciting. Yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, it's an interesting time to be alive, like for sure. Oh, yeah. And then yeah. from a robotics perspective, I mean, I don't know, like 
the more I feel like, you know, you can automate this stuff, then I feel like the more productive we get as a species and the more things we can do. And so you feel good kind of contributing to that, or at least I feel good contributing to that. So Yeah, um, yeah, that's exciting. That's yeah. exciting. Um, sometimes in a, you know, in a, in a manufacturing environment, there's a lot of, you know, the dull, dirty, dangerous jobs that um, really, you know, really help harm people muscul from a musculoskeletal standpoint or um, really make it very, you know, very un undesirable to come into work every day. Yeah. And if those jobs can be can be um, uh, shifted off to automation. I'm giggling because I've seen some people in environments, <laughs> pretty yeah. bad situations. Yeah. Where it's just, yeah. You know, I mean, we've all heard the stories about, you know, like Nets at Foxconn and stuff like that, you know, where you're just like, oh, God. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But, absolutely. Um, so, so that's, uh, uh, that's, what's exciting about seeing an improvement overall in, in yeah. improvement overall. Yeah. Yeah. For, what do you get excited about? Like, what are you, what are you kind of the most proud of that you've worked on? Um, uh, at innovation works. I just in general in your career. Um, I was excited to do those acquisitions. Nice. Uh, it was, it was great. It was, it actually helped us also, you know, uh, from a branding perspective, um, I was excited to do, um, murders and acquisitions and diagnosis. murders, and <laughs> murders. no, I'm not a murderer. Um, <laughs> sorry, mergers, <laughs> oh, good. <That's> funny. <laughs> mergers and acquisitions and divestitures, uh, at Xerox, um, from a hey, large that, corporate awesome. stand, standpoint, it was interesting to see what assets they were divesting of, as well as what acquisitions, uh, that we worked on. Um, Xerox was like, I mean, it was big an in invention day. factory. I mean. Park was like responsible for the mouse. You know, yeah, stuff. yeah. There's a book written in the what early '60s or middle '60s called "The Billions Nobody Wanted" because Xerox lost on it almost every single invention except the copier. <laughs> so. Uh, and we thought about yeah, well, the fact that like Apple just got the mouse, right? I mean, it's kind of an interesting example of that. I spent time at Park uh, a long time actually. Actually. Yeah, back and forth. I, I what was that at, like? Uh, it was very exciting. Um, there are some really uh, innovative thinkers there, and you know uh, the words and the uh, the theories and the you know the um, the vision that they had is what I'm seeing. You know, in the last ten years now, that was twenty years ago. Yeah. And now I'm seeing it. You know, actually come to fruition, like ubiquitous computing. What's ubiquitous computing? Is that it's everywhere, all around. Oh, you, okay, got it. It's right? ubiquitous. And right. It's yeah, that's exactly what you said. <laughs> um, you know, things like that, you know, the ideas that were not quite, um, not quite, you, you couldn't quite imagine those uh, in, in your world back then. Or it seemed probably lofty. I mean, I, I feel yes. like I'll, I'm, yes. I mean, I'm guilty of that too, where I'll be kind of a naysayer and bull, bullish on something that ends up doing really well. And I'll be the first to admit when I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> what was like, well, give an example. Fair enough. Um, so I'm trying to think of one where like I, um, Maybe crypto. So like like when bitcoins were twenty dollars each, I um had three of them and I just lost the password because I didn't care. And now they're worth like I don't know what they're up to, but it's like forty to sixty K probably if I if I had to guess. And you still have them? No, I lost the password. <laughs> so it's like over a hundred grand that I'll never see again. <laughs> it's I just you know, I was like, what well, yeah, it's my net loss is sixty dollars. I mean, you know. But... So is it because you think you think there's not a value there or what? Why well, at the time I didn't think there was going to be a value, right? This okay. would have been in like the mid two thousands and I just, you know, like 2008 ish, but mm. I, I just remember thinking, you know, like this will be interesting to play with, you know, and I, I think I set up like the mining and I was sticking around as like a hobbyist, but then I sort of lost interest. I'm like, well, these never be worth anything, you know? <laughs> what do you think of NFTs? Um, I have mixed thoughts on them. Uh, I like that there's a new form of artistic expression. Um, I don't know. I guess I'm probably a little bit bullish on them. What do you think of NFTs? I guess I I don't know if it's a generational thing, but to me, it's it's got to be you know not a digital art expression. It's got to be a physical art expression in some yeah. way. Whether it's even if it's music or or whatever it is. Yeah, for just, sure. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, my observation has been a lot of the people that are trading and purchasing NFTs are the people that made millions of dollars on Bitcoin. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. that's right. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of a perpetuation. But yeah. then I wonder, like, is that sustainable? Like, who am I to say it isn't? I mean, you know, they've already made so much money, you know. I don't know. I mean, maybe it'll keep going forever. Maybe it's a Ponzi scheme. I mean, who the hell knows? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, I know. I know. Uh, but didn't they say something about um, announcing the di uh, the upcoming digital dollar? Wasn't that an announcement today? I, I, I haven't heard about that yet. Tell me more. I, I just saw a headline. Uh, you know, just again, moving toward digital currency. You mean like uh, federally? Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Um, if you think about um, Africa and other developing countries, they've got a lot of digital transactions more than... more than, Actually? Yes. Didn't know that. Yeah. I guess that makes sense. So you don't have to run printing presses and stuff. I mean... And it's, you know, all, you know... Um, uh, activated and, and, and um, enabled by the phone, um, uh, and as that continues, do you know where in Africa? Because like last time was in Morocco. I mean, I was paying cash for everything, but I don't know. I don't know exactly, but I can tell you. Um, uh, my parents were from India. Yeah, year, you know, years ago they were both. Um, say it ain't so. No, I'm just kidding. Pardon? I said say it ain't so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but back in uh, the late 50s and early 60s, and you know, we used to go to uh, India quite often as oh, cool. as, as youngsters. Uh, That's awesome. Spent uh, quite a bit of time there, and then you know, subsequently afterwards, uh, and our manufacturing company had a uh, had a factory there as well. Um, but in the early 2000s, uh, in our middle 2000s, it was amazing to me to see even beggars on the street having cell phones. Yeah, yeah, I've noticed that too. Right? You know, right? Yeah, I mean, well, it's the same here. I mean, you just like, you know, it's homeless people, cell phones. You know? Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, well, now they have like Instagram accounts and, you know, just Venmo and, you know, don't my want me. That's okay, I've got a Venmo. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. So, but, uh, but yeah, yeah, it's it, things are changing rapidly. Yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah. It's kind of, a, I mean, you talk about like equalizers. I mean, the fact that everybody's got, you know, a phone number or some way to get in touch or at the very least like a WhatsApp account that they can tether to Wi-Fi. I mean, that's pretty cool to see. Kind of. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I, I would agree. I would agree. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Yeah. It does make me smile when I see like hashtag the real Philly Phil outside of China. <laughs> it's like, look, look me up on Instagram. <laughs> What's parents. your favorite social media platform? I personally LinkedIn. LinkedIn, it's yeah. It's the least too. filled with drama. Yeah, <laughs> that's, uh... that's so well said. Thanks. <laughs> it is. It's sort of like very practical. You well, know? I've even thought about being a dick on LinkedIn, and you like sometimes you want to troll, you know, something that seems kind of silly. Like, yeah, I was reading an article on Industry 4.0 at work the other day, just because I wanted to understand the concept, um, which I probably should, given that I'm working on it. But um, I don't think anybody really knows. Like, I, I, I think a lot of th it kind of strikes me as buzzwordy. And I, hopefully this isn't like unpopular or, you know, too cynical sounding. But in the Wikipedia article for Industry 4.0, it mentions gene splicing or gene modification as something that's going to be an enable. I'm like, how the fuck is that going to end up on the manufacturing? F like, what? <laughs> Maybe indirectly, but like not like, what? <laughs> you know, like, what? Who wrote this article? You know, and so, <laughs> yeah, somebody, yeah. somebody uh, made it up. Exactly. And so I, I sometimes I'll see a thing on LinkedIn where I'm just like, you know, like I want to troll it so badly and I'll, I'll just be like, ah, I, stupid idiot. But then I'm like, if I do that, like that is not a good move in terms of my career. And then it keeps me from being a jerk, which makes it less drama filled for the other person. And I, I imagine that it's like that for a lot of people. And that's why it's just a more low key chill kind of controlled adult place to hang out, you know, it's because people are a little more concerned about the consequences if they act like assholes. <laughs> so. You're, you're, you're right. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. That's very, very true. Yeah, I'm just um, speculating. But... Yeah. But it's also, like you said, a low key adult, less drama. It's. Yeah. Well, that's fun. I like going on LinkedIn. Like I, I enjoy it. I mean, you know, you find I've gotten jobs on there. I mean, yeah, a bunch of them. <laughs> so it's, serious minded people yeah for sure right yeah and i mean it's everybody likes an echo chamber i guess we're you know 
entrepreneurs or capitalists or whatever you want to call it. And so it's like you get a lot of that on LinkedIn because that's what it's based around. That's true. That's true. Yeah. 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 That's, you know, that's very true. Um, uh, so, um, you know, one of the things that, uh, that I was mentioning, uh, you know, just growing up actually in a family of entrepreneurs, uh, on my mother's side, especially, um, there's so much uncertainty, you know, we talked about uncertainty, uh, in terms of, uh, the future or even the present. Um, and, and folks like you, you said you're anxious, Yeah, yeah for sure. but, but you said in the heat of, you know, when the pandemic hit, you were very calm. Yeah. And if I'm on the floor having to make a split second decision, I'm also very calm. Yeah. <laughs> If I'm working on a crazy deadline, like I, I'm some of the calmest I've ever been, but then, you know, ask me to, I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I'm not like a social awkward, but I used to be like that. That was one of the most terrifying things for me as a kid was like socializing or trying to be around people. Um, I mean, I guess, yeah. Like sometimes just like, you know, yeah. Just talking to certain people is scary for me, but then, you know, when, the power goes out and nobody knows what to do. I'm just like, you know, on it and fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's true. Uh, so, so, uh, entrepreneur is always a person ready to act in a crisis. <laughs> Cause there's always crisis. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. No, I mean, we talk about that at form logic, like what's the crisis du jour. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Especially in making parts. Yeah. For right? Sure. right. Yeah. Yeah, cool. The aerospace tolerances at that. So, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of stuff that can go wrong. I mean, <laughs> I've, I've seen tools break. I mean, you've seen tools break a million ways. I oh, mean, yeah. 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 People uh, get injured in ungodly ways. I mean, there's so many different, like, not from, we haven't had any serious injuries there, but at past jobs, I mean, I had a boss at a certain company that um, amputated their thumb because they brought down a, uh, I've actually talked about this in the show before. But they were using, a, like, I think a DeWalt um, carbide-tipped miter saw, and they had the 80-20 extrusion they were cutting, and they put their thumb between the extrusion and the chop saw, and they brought it down, and it bit, and it... Oh! Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that happened. And then I remember another time at the same company, somebody over-tightened a bolt, and it stretched out and did what's called necking. And then at a certain point, you hit the yield pressure because bolts are hardened, and it just cracks and it shot like a bullet and embedded in a concrete wall. Luckily, nobody was hurt. Oh, so that's what could have got somebody pretty, pretty bad. It would have been like a bullet. Yeah, it would have, yeah. yeah, exactly. If you would have been in front of you would have been dead. Oh, wow. But um, I don't know. I mean, I actually, it was an interesting with a robot that a friend told me. I wasn't there for this one, but it was, uh, it was a universal robot and um, they were using it way faster than it was designed to be used because the client, like every client, was on a budget. And this was for an automation job my friend was doing. And so they were loading these stamping presses and unloading them and loading them and unloading them. And the robot was dying because it was moving way faster than it should. And it was just operating in the red the entire time to use like a car analogy. And finally, it couldn't get out of there fast enough. And the stamping press crushed it like a pancake. Oh, my. So, yeah, I mean, it's good a person wasn't there, you know. And it was completely broken? Yeah, just a flattened $30,000 robot. <laughs> <laughs> wow yeah that's crazy yeah that's crazy yeah so huh. yeah, you talk about dangerous jobs i mean it's probably <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah that, that that is a dangerous job yeah yeah exactly we, we uh yeah we, we had heat we had presses we had weight um yeah we had chemicals you name it <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> so, <laughs> but, i'm learning about some of that lately might, might do the recro training here soon <laughs> <laughs> well so um uh, what, Spencer, what do you think, um, listeners, uh, would be interested in, in terms of learning about innovation works? I mean, that's a good question. I, I was giggling because at this point, I mean, I, I make this podcast more just to hang out <laughs> to engage listeners, but I feel like that's selfish. Um, I had to speculate. I mean, we have a lot of nerds, I think, like that are the audience, like, I mean, that's the biggest, it's, it's just technical people like the people that have been on the show often end up subscribing and, and, and being listeners which is kind of kind of funny i mean it's like a maybe that's a ponzi scheme right <laughs> <laughs> um yeah well 
I guess what I'm interested in is, um, and maybe that's a good place to start. And then, you know, other people might find that interesting too, um, is like, what's coming up next. Um, I know that I always saw like alpha lab gear investing like $50,000 and $25,000 in a bunch of companies. Yeah. Any plans for like bigger, more targeted investments that would be interesting to know about. Um, um, so, so I think there's some additional federal funding coming. I don't know if that changes, uh, our current investment amounts. Yeah. Um, uh, the 50,000 sort of across the board is, is relatively recent. Uh, it's, it's a really good position because it's also now a convertible note with a 2% equity, uh, oh, cool. uh, uh, position. Uh, oh, that's, yeah, start. that's, that's more favorable than it was back in the day. Yes. Yes. Yeah. At, at some point we even took as high as six or 7% equity. Yeah. Um, so, so this is much more favorable. 2% is, is really not a big deal. Yeah. Um, uh, but our, but with our new chief investment officer, they're looking at different ways to analyze investments, um, perhaps some more, uh, flexibility on the investment amounts. Um, so I would expect, uh, health is a higher investment amount, right? Pardon? Health is a higher investment amount from what, yes, uh, what it is. It's a hundred. Yes. Yeah. Uh, recognizing that it takes, whether it's a diagnostic or a therapeutic, there's no way to build anything like that for less than a hundred grand and even a right. hundred, you're not doing a whole lot. I mean, so. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a longer path. It's a longer path recognized. Right. Um, so, so, uh, I would expect more changes to come uh, and good changes because the market is changing rapidly. Uh, there's, you know, just like we said earlier, there's, there's a lot of money out there. Um, albeit, you know, it's, it's still smart money and they, they're looking to make the best bets. Um, but uh, Innovation Works, uh, given its, its status as a nonprofit uh, investor, um, is continuing to to work to refine its processes and uh, and investment amounts and so forth. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah no, it's, I mean, it's just good to hear the organization growing. It's good to be hanging out with you. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, um, I actually didn't know Rich that well, but you know, it seemed like he did a good job helping the organization. So it was interesting to see him step down. I mean, Mike's a very good friend of mine, so it was cool to see him step up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's need exciting. To be, need to be watching all this stuff. And yeah. then, I mean, I don't know. I, I'm excited to kind of see what Alana gets up to coming up with uh, 412. Yeah. I, I feel like uh, there's there's potential there. So. Yeah, it's exciting. It's it's really good. Um, I think you... a lot of good things happen. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. That's okay. Who, who would you keep your eye on, like right now, in the Pittsburgh ecosystem, if you were me? Uh, from an investment standpoint or a company standpoint? I guess maybe both, like just, just different people, different companies, different investments that are kind of up and coming and on the rise. I've been a little bit out of the loop lately just because of my new job. I mean, I haven't been tracking the startup world as closely as I, as I normally do. So, uh, one of, um, IW invested early on, uh, in the seed investment, AGOT, AI. Yeah. Uh, company, uh, CMU, uh, uh, graduates, but cool. not CMU technology, um, on, uh, AI, um, uh, in, in the kitchen in the fast casual restaurants and oh, other applications. They're growing like crazy. I think their last round was 17 million. It's not a bad um, round. Pardon? So that's not a bad round. No, not at all. And, uh, uh, they're hiring uh, left and right as well, and they're right here. What was interesting about them, um, we invested a very modest amount very early on. Um, uh, what's interesting about them is um, they did explore moving to the Bay Area and realized that it would be much more um, efficient and, uh, and, and, and successful the first if they built it here. Pardon? <laughs> so that's not the first time I've heard that. I know, I know. I mean, he... Uh, Evan D. Santola literally came back and said, it doesn't make sense to, yeah. to start there. Uh, and they've been extremely successful at raising funding from all over the country. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. And I know Brandon from Four Growers was saying the same thing after they did Y Combinator. He's like, yeah, we just want to get the hell out of there because yeah. it's going to be just a crazy burn. Uh, I remember, you remember Roros, uh, Ariel and Korea. Yes. I remember they were asking like one of their Bay Area investors, you know, if they should uh, set up in the Bay Area, if they were mad, if they went back to Pittsburgh, like, why, so you can spend our money faster, you know, like, <laughs> <in> Pittsburgh. 
<laughs> yes, yes, uh, agreed. So that's a that's one to to watch. Um, uh, another one is Soba Sage. Soba Sage. Uh, okay. Ego AI. Will Kegler. Sage. Will Kegler. Okay. Um, uh, recent graduate from Alpha Lab Gear. They're also raising around and making some great, um, uh, great progress in the sleep sleep market. Oh, cool. Uh, there was another one that was trying to do that. It was like an app or something. I remember from a while ago that was in the IW portfolio. Yeah, I don't I remember, remember what the, the hell name it was called. One. Yeah. Um, you got to hit it with a scout. I know shot. what you're saying. Yeah, I know yeah. exactly much what you're saying. I can think of her and yeah. I can see her standing at the front of the conference yeah. room, but I can't remember. I uh, mean, also struggled with insomnia a little bit, so I have a particular interest in those yes, technologies. Yes, it was. Yeah, she. Yeah, there was a lot about the app with the rhythm. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm sorry. I I can't place no, it. That's all I good. See it. Um, and then on the on the robotic side, let me think. There's there's a lot of uh, exciting, fun things happening. Um, RE squared. We've talked about them. A couple oh yeah, of for times. sure. Another yeah. Doing... There's cool some stuff. really excitement. I mean, there. do you know their their commercial portfolio surpassed their government recently? I did not know that. Yeah, yeah oh, they're doing that's more stuff for products, right? Wow. wow, that's really really good. Yeah. Um, I didn't think it was that. I thought I thought it was reaching parity at some point, but I didn't realize. Yeah, yeah. That. I know. I think I think they're doing more for the private sector than they are for the Fed at this point. That's amazing. Yeah. I didn't realize it had moved that quickly. Yeah, I was surprised too when I heard it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that's that's cool. I mean, it might have changed back if it's parity, but yeah, uh, I think I think that's where they're at. Very cool. Like, it was like a sixty percent. It wasn't like a crazy majority last I heard, but I don't know. I mean, I could, I could have old information too. I mean, this is very very cool. Yeah. What I get excited about, Spencer, is to see um, sort of like the really really cool tech things like Ari squared, you know, doing automation and other. Um, uh, process changes in a big, big way, like their submarine and you know submersibles and all that. The Navy project. Yes. Yeah. Um, but I also like to see companies that are you know focused on the small, medium uh, size manufacturing sector and business sector to to make even sort of I'll say you know partial step changes, not big, huge transformational changes, but to really just you know step by step transform what folks are doing out there. Yeah. Still the biggest employers, um, small, medium sized businesses across the country. Uh, I believe they're still the biggest employer uh, uh, in the country. And for these folks to adapt changes in, in automation and processes is, is, is exciting for me, having been one myself. Nice. So, yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, like if you can do something now that actually improves efficiency or margin or yield or whatever. You know, even if it's only by like, you know, 20%, 5%, you know, even like 7% is exciting and depending on the scale of it. Um, I mean, that's much more exciting than an idea that never gets done, you know, <laughs> that yes. you could improve it 10x or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that's exciting. Sweet. Yeah. All right. Um, so I feel like we're at like a good natural stopping point. Is there anything you want to plug besides the companies you've already talked about? <laughs> um, well, I'd say watch this space for Alpha Lab Gear. Yeah. I'm excited by what Mike and the team, including Matt and Stacy and Jeff and myself, um, are are sort of um, uh, pursuing. I know Stacy uh, and think, Jeff yet. I'm excited. Yeah, <laughs> I think there's going to be um, a lot of um, a lot of uh, sort of you know uh, sort of waking up from almost being dead for the last two years in terms of physical space, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and, and I'm excited about that. I'm excited about taking that next step. That's awesome. Uh, and it's it's not just in industrial automation opportunities, but consumer products, uh, even soft goods and other products. So I'm, I'm excited about it. So great. Stay well, tuned. Stay tuned. Innovation Works, Alpha Lab Gear. Great things coming. Great things already come out. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. If you've stuck around this long and you like what you've heard, please give us a like and smash that subscribe button or smash that like button and give us a subscribe. But we're always looking for new and interesting people to have on the show. If you know anyone good, send an email to podcast at ska.solutions or leave a comment below. Thanks again for listening and please come to the next one.